Hi, everybody. This is Martin Patella for Life Enthusiast Online Network, TV and radio. With me today, Spencer Feldman, founder and uh, chief technologist at Remedy Link. But today, maybe not so much about uh, the chemical, medical, plant-based tools. Let's get into the world of electro, um, I don't know, I don't dare to call it electromedicine, which it probably shouldn't be. But hey, Spencer, what do you want to say about this? Hey, Martin. So have you ever heard of grounding or earthing? I surely have, and I practice, and of course, Grounding is the universal source of electrons for us human right. beings. So, and of course, electrons are the uh, the electric charges, lack of which cause acidity, and abundance of which cause alkalinity or at least balance. Mm. Right. You want to say something about that, right? So, um, electrons come from the sun through the solar wind. Uh, they hit our atmosphere. Uh, lightning takes it down to the earth. And then there it is in the ground, and some of it's in the air. And we are designed to absorb electricity from the earth, from our food and from the air. Recent um, renaissance in grounding or earthing, which for your viewers who don't know what that is, is basically running a metal wire or cable from the ground to wherever you're working or sleeping so that you're getting the equivalent as if you were barefoot on the ground. Well, I started doing this grounding a couple of years ago, and it's very interesting. I noticed a sense of calm. I can't say I noticed anything physically, but it was nice. And then I came across a bit of information that said that the voltage drops 100 volts for every foot you are above the ground. Now, I was raised in New York City on the eighth floor, 10 feet of floor, Eight floors at 80 feet, 80 times 100. That meant I was living at 8,000 volts positive. Electricity was being, electrons were being pulled out of me with 8,000 volts of force. I also know that if you walk across a carpet and can create a spark and touch a doorknob, that's at least 7,000 volts positive, which I could do where I was living. So I was raised at around 15,000 volts positive. That meant all the time I was up in that apartment walking on the carpet, electricity, electrons were being pulled out of my body with like eight, with 15,000 volts minimum of force. Yeah, you know, discharging, dis discharging, ste stealing the power to neutralize. I, I, I just want to make that point really clear. Uh, an electron taken away is oxidation. Mm -hmm. An electron donated is reduction chemically or antioxidation and it also has to do with ph acidity mm -hmm. is an electron taken away alkalinity is electron given so what you're talking about there is you are constantly donating electrons to the space and you are having yeah. to find a way to realkalize this acidifying metabolic process in your body right yeah, you know, I understand now why I used to take such long showers when I was growing up, because while I'm in the shower, my feet are in the bathtub, which is conducted down the drain, down the pipe to the earth. It's the only time I was getting any electricity in that apartment. Right, and the water is naturally grounded because it's running typically through right. metal pipes that are connecting it to the earth itself. Yeah, so we're designed to have electricity go through our feet, into the meridians, into the organs. But because we wear shoes and synthetic clothes and live in carpets, they leave our organs through the meridians and out into the environment. We're bleeding electrons left, right, and center. Now, there's three ways you would get it. Through your bare feet or sleeping on the ground, through raw food, and through breathing. When you eat raw food, uh, every membrane has electricity in it, assuming it's fresh, and you eat it and then the electricity the voltage gradient is available to you. When you breathe air, at least 100 years ago, the air was mostly negative. It was 20% negatively charged. Now- Allow me to just butt in here for a sec. Sure. It, we talk about the negative ionization or positive ionization. The typical urban indoor air 
has abundance of positive ions, whereas the typical forest air or by the beach, ocean air, has abundance of negative ionization. So when you make it into the park, among the trees, you're going to be interacting with air that's richly filled with negative ions. When you're sitting in your car with those rubber tires uh, creating static electricity by its contact with pavement and so on, you're in space that's got plenty of positive ions, which are less desirable. Anyway, back to you on that. Right. So studies have shown that 100 years ago, air was 20% more negative than positive, and that now it's 20% more positive than negative. So every time I walk, instead of getting electrons from my feet, I'm leaving them out. Everything I eat, instead of getting electrons in my digestive tract, I'm getting a net negative by eating food that's got the electrons that have been blown out. Because when you cook food, well, the advantage is you kill the parasites and the tapeworms and the, the bacteria, and you've broken down the cell wall so it's more assimilable, but then you've also lost the enzymes and what I'm referring to specifically, the electron charge. And then the air, now we're discharging ions, electrons out of our lungs. So I thought, okay, grounding's not enough because that's just taking me to neutral. I need to reverse the 15,000 volts I was raised in, but I also need to do something for how I'm supposed to eat and how I'm supposed to breathe. I don't necessarily want to eat 100% raw food, and I can't live by a seashore or a waterfall. That's just not what my life's about right now. So I decided to build a machine that would do it for me. So I built a machine that you plug in and you, it comes with a, a little uh, kind of chain mail pad, 16,000 rings, and you put your feet on it. And then you turn it up anywhere from one to you know, 20,000 volts, and you uh, flood your body with electrons. And that was very interesting. I, I was kind of addicted to it. And what I explain to people is, uh, let's say someone says, well, what do you think about such and such a supplement? Now, mind you, I make supplements. But is it a deficiency of that supplement? There are base things that we are deficient in. We don't, we don't get them, it's a problem. We need food, water, exercise, sunshine, sleep, loving relationships, and electrons. And if we're missing any of those, it's foolish, I think, or short-sighted to try to take supplements for things where you are got a deficiency in something. I'll give you an example, right? Let's say a woman has, uh, someone's got arthritis, right? Well, you could give them chondroitin sulfate and it would help. And maybe they have a deficiency of those things, but not enough electrons can cause inflammation and pain. So before I go to the chondroitin, let me try the, the, the electrons. Someone else could say, hey, you know, they've got some depression. Sure, it could be a tryptophan deficiency, but negative ions are part of what play, um, modulate the serotonin, serotonergic system. So let's see if they've got the electrons in first and then go there. So I think electrons come in at this very base causal level. Right. Got to fix it. You know, be be this, before you start going into all these esoteric things, ask yourself or your client, sleeping well? Good. Good diet? Check. Exercise or do you sit behind a desk all day long? Good. Sleep? Great. Sunshine, yes. Electrons, no. Almost nobody gets them. So I built this machine and I was putting the electrons in and I was, I'm not gonna say I was addicted to it, Martin, but I had that thing on full blast for hours a day, for days, and my body was just sopping it up like, like I had just walked through the Sahara Desert and I had free access to water. I was just, I couldn't uh, get enough. This is, this is a difference between addiction and, uh, and enjoyment. Like, I'm addicted to oxygen. Mm. No, I just need it to carry on, right? It's not an addiction. It's just a requirement. We just don't know it. And this is what you're demonstrating with your words about the electrons. Your body wants it. Yes. I didn't know at the time. I, I thought, well, maybe it's, you know, maybe I am addicted to it. But here's what happened. Over the course of a couple of weeks, my desire, my need for it decreased. 
I could turn the power level lower, lower, lower. Now on the lowest setting, 10, 15 minutes twice a day, that's all I need to keep my batteries charged. But I can tell you what happened to me personally when I started putting electrons in. Now, I was a fruitarian when I was in my 20s. It was a stupid thing to do. And you know, I didn't want to kill. I thought, you know, it's a karma-free food, right? And I ended up um, creating some peripheral neuropathy from all the sugar I ate, all the fructose. And I've had it for years. And even I'd have to wear heavy socks, even in summertime to bed, because my circulation, my feet was so damaged from what I did to myself. About three or four days into using this thing, and all of a sudden my feet start getting hot. Okay, I take off my socks. Interesting. And I go to sleep and as I'm, I'm laying down, I'm like, I, I think I don't need socks tonight. I take them off. That was it. I have not worn socks to bed for the last several months. And it, the, blood, the blood flow came back. The next thing that happened I noticed was the, um, the, the neuropathy started to go away, the tingling went. Maybe about a month into it, all that was left was two spots, one on the tip of each big toe that was still numb. And then that disappeared, and never to return. So, I mean, I was thrilled that that's what it was. And I thought, well, how could electrons have caused that to, how could, a, I don't get it, wait a minute. What does electrons have to do with peripheral neuropathy? So I thought about, um, I started studying electrostatics, which is the science of how electricity causes things to stick together. Actually, I would like to just butt in with a teeny little bit of something. People should understand the, the difference between a current and potential. Mm, sure. They are used to talking about, about electricity in the sense of current, where it flows, where there is a um, just movement of energy from one end to the other. But a potential is a static difference in capacity so uh, anyway I'll hand it back to you just just with the highlight of please understand that there is a big difference in electricity between current which is in a flow and potential which is which is a like a bottle of water available to you to drink whenever you want it you make a great point so let me talk a little bit about electricity I want you to imagine that you're standing outside of a giant water tower. It's a water tank, it's 50 feet high, okay? The water in this case represents electrons. Now, if I drill a one foot hole in the bottom of that tank, that water is gonna come out and knock me over. It's gonna come out with a lot of force. That force is the current. There's just a lot of, how do I say this? The flow rate is enormous, okay? It's the, um, but if I drill a tiny hole in there, less water is going to come out, okay? So the height of the water, the amount that it can push is the voltage. The amount that flows is the current, and it's the current that's the dangerous one. So the machine that I made has very high voltage, very low current. And what separates it from all the other things that are out there is most machines pass current through you. Um, there's two electrodes and it'll go from point A to point B. This machine, there's just one electrode and it's just going into you. It doesn't go out. If it were to go out again, you would not have any net gain of electrons. So what we're doing is we're letting it raise our charge. It's, bas it's, very, it's, it's basically charging a battery and it has to be, and that's the volt. So it's, it's the pressure, it's the voltage that's pushing it in. Yeah. This, what you're saying reminded me of some experiences that people have had with grounding is sleeping on a, on some kind of a tool, a mat, or something that they would connect to and that was permanently hooked into the ground circuit. Mm -hmm. After some time, they find themselves being overcharged because if they do long hours of that, they essentially are acting as an antenna where the electric potential that exists up around them somewhere, wherever they are, is flowing through their body into that ground rod and out. So they find themselves essentially being overcharged in that sense. I don't think you can get overcharged because you're only going to go to the same exact charge as the planet. But I don't doubt that something might be happening for them. But what it is, yeah. I'm not sure.
yeah, you're right about that there's no potential for being overcharged. I, I'm just remembering talking to these clients who are saying that they felt uh, overstimulated. Hmm. I don't, don't know how to. They might have been getting some something from the 60 hertz from the wall coming through them. Yeah, that that and cell and cell towers and all of that nonsense yeah. going through them. That that was the whole point of that. Yeah. Well, so I built this machine, uh, very high voltage, low very low current, so it can't hurt anybody. And all these conditions start to clear up for me that I've had for years. I figured, well, that's pretty interesting. Uh, so I tried to understand why it might have been helping with peripheral neuropathy. So if you take a balloon and you rub it on a piece of wool, it'll stick to the wall. The essence of all adhesion, all glue, all stickiness is electricity. That's what happens. The balloon and the wall are both arguing over who gets to hold on to the electrons. And since they both want to hold on, they stick together. For some. Mm, what's happening is that the protons on the balloon surface and the protons on the wall surface are both fighting over the same few bits of electrons. They both want the electrons for their, for their own. And so mm -hmm. they're both, they're sharing it and that's the glue. Now, this force, this electrostatic force becomes, it's not very strong at this level. You can knock the balloon off the wall. Right? Although sometimes you see, you get your hands in a package full of styrofoam, styrofoam is impossible to get you off, off you, right? It's, it's once the electrons you've got. It keeps coming back. Yeah, but when you get to smaller and smaller um, levels, uh, dimensions, it becomes uh, exponentially more powerful. So at the level of the capillary, the red blood cell can get stuck in the 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 uh, static force of a red blood cell inside a capillary can be enormous. Now, capillaries represent 85% of our blood supply. Le uh, veins and arteries are only 7%. So we're mostly capillary, even though very little attention is paid to it. And so what happens is the capillaries, um, they, the way the blood is supposed to be negatively charged and the capillary arteries and veins are supposed to be negatively charged. And so the two don't touch. They kind of magnetically right. touch each other. Right? Yeah, magnetic levitation. Like a magnetic lift train. But when they are losing their charge, and they stick to each other, and they can get jammed up in there. And if you ever look at uh, capillary blood flow under a microscope, say under a, a fingernail or something, you'll see that the blood is just stagnant. It just sits there. I, forgot. I mean, sometimes it moves, but sometimes it's just for minutes, a red blood cell will be stuck. That's what I think it was. I think the peripheral neuropathy was the sugar damaging the, 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 the blood vessels, but also the years and years of being a positive voltage and my capillary bed just got so full of positive charge or so low on electrons that everything stuck together. And then when I finally uh, got enough electrons in there to open it all up, the blood flowed, the heat came on, the nerves were able to repair and it was just, a, it was a miracle for me. So then the next thing I did is I thought, well, how can I eat electricity? Oh gosh, you know, electrons, they, they don't hang around very long. You know, they, they're, they're gone. What can I do? You know, so what I did is I attached, I, I, look, I figured out how to make an electric liposome. And a liposome is a sphere that has something inside of it that it'll, it'll carry it in. So I took um, a Vitamix, because that was the model that seemed to handle what I was trying to do the best. And I electrified the um, spinning blades with an egg, with, and then I put in water and lecithin and let it blend. So it's making liposomes under high negative voltage. And then I drank it down and it was quite an amazing experience what it felt like when the electricity got into my liver and started opening up internally. So I feel like- I'd be very curious to hear how you managed to connect the uh, electricity to the blades. Oh yeah. So um, the the mich I'll, I'll 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 tell you that towards the end how I got that into there. All right, cool. It took, it took a little trick, and then the last thing is I wanted to breathe it in. So I took a um, a tube uh, and I put a reaction chamber inside, uh, and I attached the electrons to it so that as I breathed in, the air was being electrified. So I was getting the electrons in my lungs. So you're getting essentially negative ionized air. Exactly. Uh, it's a trick because too high and you'll make ozone, but the right level, you'll get the ions. And so now I had what I thought was 
you know, through my feet, I was getting what I thought was the equivalent of, you know, a, um, an enormous amount of electrons through my skin. Yeah, walking on the beach every day. Exactly. Through my blender, uh, I was getting what I thought would be the equivalent of hundreds of meals of raw food. And then breathing would be, I mean, far more than you'd ever get at the beach. The ion concentration was enormous from breathing it in. So uh, we've got this machine now, and the way in which you attach it to the blender is, first you have to get a, a Vitamix blender. Other blenders might work, but this is the only one I'm, I'm for sure with. And then you send, um, when you get the machine, you send me the pitcher, the top part, and we'll take it to our shop, and we will adapt it so that we can uh, plug in directly uh, into the part that will get it then attached to the blades. So the electricity is going from the machine into the base of the unit and up into the blades. So as it spins, it's spinning under high voltage. Right. And so this, this charge machine, how big is that now? Uh, it's, you know, like that, you know, about a foot it's by a foot by... The size yeah. of a power supply for a computer? Yeah, something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, like a, like, a, like a big old school dictionary you might find in a, in a library. Right on. So oh, yeah. it's portable enough that you can actually put it on the kitchen counter and hook your uh, Vitamix to it. Yeah, you can carry it over. I, it kind of goes back and forth between my kitchen counter and my sofa. All right. Okay, and so is it still uh, linked to something like the chain mail kind of metal mat? Uh, I, it's one or the other. So you take the output and you either put it through the chain mail and put it on your feet or put it into the, the breathing system and the reaction chamber, or you attach it to your blender. It's, it's only got one output. And then, uh, you know, you want to drink it down, you know, within a few minutes, because liposomes are somewhat fragile. They don't last forever. Mm -hmm. Right on. Well, that's awesome, because uh, everything that you're saying makes total sense from the physiological understanding that we have about life. I think you're onto it in a big way with the electricity. With pushing the electrons into the body. Mm. It's, a, it's a very peaceful experience when they, for me anyway, when I, uh, when I get the machine turned on and I'm on it, it's like an instant meditative state. My body just goes to this place of, like all the alarms, all the alarms get turned off. You know, it's like, you know, if you're hungry, it's an alarm. If you're tired, if you're, if you're thirsty, you know, those are only the body gets an alarm alarm state and I, I didn't realize that not having enough electrons was creating some background level of alarm state in my body that just completely just got turned off mm -hmm. when I gave it what it needed. Here's, here's a couple of thoughts that go along this, that train of thinking. One is that people really enjoy a high dose of vitamin C either orally or intravenously. And of mm. course vitamin C is an electron donor. Mm. So that's, that's an important tool that, that helps us nutritionally to deal with the electron deficiency. And the kind, of, is, kind of. Pardon? Finish your thought and then I'll... I'll, I'll well, try. if you want to argue, sure. But that's what I hear from uh, the orthomolecular boys doing 600 milligrams of vitamin C every hour on the hour just mm. pushing it through until the illness gives away, or mm. gives way. Mm. The other thing I found recently was uh, this thing called carbon 60, C60, mm. which the way I understand it is that it's a uh, cage made of carbon atoms within which the uh, protons or, or hydrogen likes to dwell. And as the hydrogen gets into this cage, it's more than willing to give up its electrons because uh, it's electrically able to marry itself to the carbons. Mm. Anyway, the, the point of that being is that the C60 ends up being a universal electron donor as it travels around the body. Mm. So as long as there's input intake of hydrogen, the hydrogen, the hydrogen needs to be present, and then all of this cascade of resupplying of electrons much faster than what, for example, vitamin C could do. So this would be my thoughts on the matter. Antioxidants 
work by donating electrons. Now, once the vitamin C donates its, its electron, it's now an oxidized vitamin C. Mm -hmm. Now, what can it do? It has to go visit with glutathione. It has to go and get another electron on it. It has to be recycled. Mm -hmm. So people who take lots and lots of antioxidants but don't have enough electrons, it's like having a city with lots and lots of food trucks and no food or one loaf of bread in the truck. You can keep adding trucks. And every time you take vitamin C, it gets to be used one time and then it has to be recycled. That's true. Now, if you have enough electrons, then that vitamin C can get recycled millions of times a second. There are antioxidants that can react a billion times a second, but that requires that they be, okay, so the way an antioxidant usually works, and there's exceptions to the rule, is that they will give up their electron to a more dangerous free radical, but then the antioxidant itself becomes a mild free radical and has to be regenerated. It has, it has to get an electron back. So all the antioxidants we take, if we don't match or pair them with electrons, they can only work one time versus the millions of times a second they could work. Right, yeah. If the so, glutathione level is uh, inefficient or if the liver is inefficient and re at recycling the glutathione. Even the glutathione, it has to, where is the glutathione going to get its electron from again? Back, back to methylation in the liver. But it, well, you still need to get the electrons into the body for the glutathione, for, the li for all of these things to activate. Yeah, I hear All of them to recycle. Yeah, the I hear you. It's an important point saying that uh, there has to be a net electron inserted into the body else it's missing and if you're walking around barefoot and breathing fresh air and eating raw food then fantastic you don't need to buy antioxidants in a bottle because the very few you're getting from your food are working a million times faster because they've got the electrons to do the work with and if you don't have the electrons then we try you know to get more and more antioxidants in it's like saying Yes, let's keep sending trucks with one loaf of bread in to feed the city. Like, no, that's not efficient. You have enough trucks. You've got 10 times more trucks than you need. Take the trucks you have and fill them full of bread. Then the city is fed. And then they come back and fill them again. It's, it's a more efficient way. But let's talk about C60. Um, I was making C60 and, and, and eating it or drinking it in olive oil. Oh, gosh, five, six, seven years ago. Uh, I never noticed anything from it, but the way it was explained to me is that it acted like a battery, a, res uh, a, way, a place that could give and take electrons, like an electron bank account. Yes. So yes. that if there are too few or too many. An efficient carrier. Right. So it would, it would be um, uh, uh, a way, a reservoir. Again, a reservoir for what? If we don't have the electrons, you can have all the C60 in your tissue that you want. There's nothing going into the C60. The C60 itself doesn't do anything. Maybe it gets in some of the grooves in the DNA, but the main way it's going to be working from what we understand is it's going to be, it's, a, it's an additional char battery source. You've got this to charge is, it. This is, where, this is where people are recommending that this be taken with uh, hydrogen, either hydrogen water or inhaling hydrogen gas or some other source of hydrogen because, of course, hard, hydrogen one proton, one electron, easily separated from one another and all that. Yes, but then again, you still have to recharge the hydrogen. Yes. We've got to get plugged in, Martin, one way or the other. Yeah, There's no yeah. way around it. Good point. Good point. Still, still, the point that you're making is still valid, and that yeah. means uh, drink fruit juice or orange juice. No, no, no. I mean fresh juice, unpasteurized superfood or get barefoot on the ground or, and here comes Spencer, <laughs> plug in. Well, you know, I wish just grounding and eating raw food and breathing fresh air was enough. Because I've been raw food, you know, um, I've grounded and I've lived in places with great air and it was good, but it wasn't enough to recover the damage I had done growing up in a city without electrons. So I think, unfortunately, um, a number of us would really do a lot better with some piece of equipment that would push the electrons in with as much pressure as they were pulled out for so many years. 
And then at that point, you might need less and less. And then you can get by with, oh, I'm going to go for a walk barefoot in the park. Hey, I'm going to have a you know, an apple and a salad. Yes, I'm going to go and, and breathe some fresh country air. Yep. Go swim in a lake. Sounds lovely. Well, you want crashing water. Just being in the water isn't enough. Being in the water will get it through your skin. If you want to get the electrons in the air, the water has to move. So it's either a waterfall or waves crashing. Quite the tour de force of explaining what really is going on as far as our metabolic existence. The metabolic existence of our body is moving electrons. Oxidation is a taking away of one. Reduction is giving it back. And every chemical reaction is one or the other. Or I, I should say one thing is being oxidized, and another thing is being reduced. That's the nature of the reactions. And so if you want to be efficient, in your life, you need to have plenty of this lubrication, and that lubrication is called the electron, mm. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's, uh, it's look at the, the way a cell works, the electron transport chain, everything. It's, it comes down to oxygen and electrons and at a very base level. There's, there's no way, I, I'm, I'm astounded that the body works as well as it does needing electrons as much as it does and how few we actually get in our environment. It's a testament to just how well designed we are, that we can completely drain our, our body's batteries for decades and still function. So imagine how good you can feel, how healthy you can be if you actually get your body charged up properly. Come back to this channel for more information about the uh, Spencer Feldman Electron donor machine. This is Great. Martin Pitella for life enthusiast.com at 1 866 543 3388. Spencer, thank you very much for taking the time. This has been most enlightening and most electronizing. Thanks, Martin. It's good seeing you again. <laughs>